know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. Jaywalking punk anarchist. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer. And I'm Melody from the channel A World to Win. And we're taking a look at Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Friedrich Engels, originally published in 1880. The key idea of this text is to make a distinction between what is called utopian socialism and scientific socialism. Go figure. Well, let me explain a little better. Utopian socialism is defined as socialism achieved by the moral persuasion of capitalists to surrender the means of production peacefully to the people. According to Trust Your Wikipedia, Utopians believe that people of all classes can voluntarily adopt their plan for society if it is presented convincingly. Scientific socialism, in contrast, is defined as socialism based principally upon a belief that historical forces, such as economic determinism and class struggle, determine, usually by violent means, the achievement of socialist goals. That is to say, that socialism can only be achieved not through moral persuasion, but through class struggle, class warfare. Let's see what Friedrich Engels said about this as we take a look at the text in depth. Introduction. Right off the bat, Engels states, This book defends what we call historical materialism. Engels then defines materialism itself, stating, If we find that the object does agree with our idea of it, and does answer the purpose we intended it for, then that is positive proof that our perception of it and of its qualities so far agree with reality outside ourselves. Engels goes on to explain that when our material reality and understanding don't match up, it is our perception that is changed and not the objects themselves. For example, our observations tell us that the sun revolves around the earth. However, further observation proves that the earth revolves around the sun. Our perception is made to more closely resemble material reality. I think I'm on the verge of proving something very important. That Aristotle was wrong. The sun, not the earth, is the center of the universe. Oh, I see. I know it's not the official doctrine of the church, but I really believe it's true. Engels then goes on to define historical materialism, which argues that the changes in the modes of production and exchange, in the consequent division of society into distinct classes, and in the struggles of these classes against one another, are the main forces directing the course of human history. Historical materialism is typically explained in this way. First, we had primitive tribes, what Marx called primitive communism. This then developed into slave societies. This then developed into feudalism which then became mercantilism, which then became capitalism. And Marx and Engels and others use this lens through viewing history to anticipate that after capitalism will naturally follow socialism, and then of course fully automated luxury gay space communism. Before digging deeper into this text, we should clear up what might be a point of confusion on word usage, specifically with regards to the ways science and scientific are used. Language, as we know, has historically and geographically specific features. 19th century German is very different from 21st century English. And of course, a 19th century English translation of 19th century German, we again translate into our contemporary uses of words and so on. At each link in the chain, there are inevitable tripping points. This should be kept in mind for reading any text from another time and place from one's own. With regards to science, the German word Wissenschaft literally translates to science, however the connotative meaning of Wissenschaft more accurately correlates to something like systematic investigation, and is not relegated to what we today think of as science or the sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, etc. Further complicating this is the fact that in the 19th century, Wissenschaft also referred to a specific mode of pedagogy, specifically the teaching methods developed by Wilhelm von Humboldt, see The Invention of Nature by Andrea Wolff. With those historical facts in mind then, 
we have a greater appreciation for what Engels means by scientific socialism. The conception of socialism rooted in a deep and systemic analysis of the historical and material conditions we find ourselves in. Scientific, in this sense, is what Engels lays out in the introduction, describing his epistemological approach. For those unfamiliar with philosophical language, epistemology is simply the area of philosophy dealing with how we know what we know, and how do we organize and make sense of that information. Quote, From the moment we turn to our use of these objects of our perception, according to the qualities we perceive in them, we put to an infallible test the correctness or otherwise of our sense perception. If these perceptions have been wrong, then our estimate of the use to which an object can be turned must also be wrong, and our attempt must fail. But if we succeed in accomplishing our aim, we find that the object does agree with our idea of it, and does answer the purpose we intended it for, then that is proof positive that our perceptions of it and of its qualities, so far, agree with reality outside ourselves. And, whenever we find ourselves face to face with a failure, then we are generally not long in making out the cause that made us fail. We find that the perception upon which we acted was either incomplete and superficial, or combined with the results of other perceptions in a way not warranted by them, what we call defective reasoning. So long as we take care to train our senses properly, and to keep our action within the limits prescribed by perceptions properly made and properly used, so long as we shall find that the result of our action proves the conformity of our perceptions with the objective nature of the things perceived. Not in one single instance so far have we been led to the conclusion that our sense perception, scientifically controlled, induce in our minds ideas respecting the outer world that are, by their very nature, at variance with reality, or that there is an inherent incompatibility between the outer world and our sense perceptions of it." End quote. As we can see from this passage, the essence of Engels' scientific approach to socialism is, in our modern language, more informed by what we might call scientific principles rather than the rigid laws of physics and the strictures of the scientific method in the academic sense of the word. Chapter 1. In this chapter, Engels discusses utopian socialism. To start, Engels defines modern socialism, arguing that modern socialists recognize class antagonisms and that the capitalist class will struggle to maintain the current system despite crisis and contradiction and class conflict, and, as we see it now, desperately maintaining itself in the face of ecocidal annihilation. Engels then looks to utopian socialist thinkers and explains that, like the French philosophers, they do not claim to emancipate a particular class to begin with but all humanity at once. Like them, they wish to bring in the kingdom of reason and eternal justice, but this kingdom, as they see it, is as far as heaven from earth from that of the French philosophers. Basically, the bourgeois revolutions fell short. Their calls for liberté, égalité, fraternité, and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness were not fulfilled, and similarly, the claims of the utopian socialists were not fulfilled. Ingalls argues, These new social systems were foredoomed as utopian. The more completely they were worked out in detail, the more they could not avoid drifting off into pure fantasies. Ingalls then looks at three utopian socialist philosophers, St. Simon, Charles Fournier, Charles Fournier, Charles Fournier, Fournier, Charles Fournier, and Robert Owen. First, for St. Simon. Engels argues that he declares that politics is the science of production and foretells the complete absorption of politics by economics. For Charles Fournier, Engels looks at his history of society. He divides its whole course thus far into four stages of evolution. Savagery, barbarism, the patriarchate, and civilization. Civilization moves in a vicious cycle in contradictions which it constantly reproduces without being able to solve them. Hence it constantly arrives at the very opposite to that which it wants to attain, or pretends to want to attain. So that, example, under civilization, poverty is born of superabundance itself. And lastly, Robert Owen, who started a factory township in which 
drunkenness, police, magistrates, lawsuits, poor laws, charity were unknown. And all this simply by placing the people in conditions worthy of human beings, and especially by carefully bringing up the rising generation. And Ingalls explains that, To all these, socialism is the expression of absolute truth, reason, and justice, and has only to be discovered to conquer all the world by virtue of its own power. Chapter 2. This chapter introduces materialism and dialectics, two major concepts of scientific socialism. Materialism was covered in the introduction, but as for dialectics, dialectics is a process through which you can test the efficacy of a hypothesis, through thesis, the proposed concept, and antithesis, the critique or negation of the concept, and through that we get synthesis, the truth of the matter, or something more closely resembling truth anyway. In ancient Greece, the dialectic simply meant thinking things through. See Arthur F. Holmes's lectures on the history of philosophy. Through the process of sorting fact from fiction, one could arrive at the capital T truth. The mistaken ideas would be discarded and the correct ones would persist. The essence of this form of dialectics is that a higher truth can be reached through the clash of conflicting ideas. There are three fundamental laws of dialectics. The first is that of the unity of opposites. This is not to say that opposite things are literally equivalent with each other, but simply that so many concepts rely on their opposite, or their absence, for definition. Up does not make any sense without down, for instance. Likewise, there cannot be a bourgeoisie without a proletariat. The two classes have opposing interests, yet one cannot be defined without reference to the other. The second law has two components. The law of the transformation of quantity into quality, and the law of the transformation of quality into quantity. In the first component, consider this thought experiment. What happens if you place a single grain of rice in a pot? Would you call it a pot of rice? Probably not. What about two grains? Still not. Three, four, and so on. Eventually there comes a tipping point where quantity, each additional grain, becomes quality, the point at which we can call it a pot of rice. Another example is the game of Jenga. Each move is pretty much the same. Players take turns removing a block from the tower and placing it on top. At some point, though, the tower becomes unstable and crashes. Once again, quantity, each replacement of a block, becomes quality. The tower comes crashing down. The second component is the law of the transformation of quality into quantity. An example of this is how social movements grow. Take, for instance, the protests against police killings of young black men in Ferguson and Baltimore. They began as local struggles for justice and accountability, quality, but soon spread across the entire country, quantity, as an indictment of the racist policing institutions intrinsic to the structure of the U.S. state. The third law is that of the negation of the negation. It is the third movement in Hegel's famous triad of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. The first motion is the thesis, which meets its negation in the antithesis. The second motion is the clash between the two. In the final motion, the first negation is itself negated, and something new emerges, hence the negation of the negation. The German idealists of the 18th and 19th centuries, Kant, Schiller, Fichte, but particularly Hegel, would apply this logic to the transformations of history itself. History for them wasn't simply a random jostle of events, but a process that could be understood and explained. A process with laws, analogous to the laws of physics, that could be discovered through study. For Hegel, history was the transformation of human societies through the ages by the battles of competing ideas. A central concept in Hegel's dialectic is Aufhebung, a German word that roughly translates to sublation, which correlates to that third law of dialectics I just described, the negation of the negation. Meaning that, in these clashes of ideas in history, there is not simply a winner and a loser, 
where the winner's ideas are wholly triumphant and the loser's ideas are simply thrown in the trash can. I already am eating from the trash can all the time. Rather, the battle of ideas changes both the ideas and the actors involved. The winner jettisons some of their ideas, and the loser's ideas are wholly or partially incorporated and leave an imprint on the winner. The battle scars from the conflict become new ideas themselves. The point here is that nothing happens in a vacuum. Everything is connected. History develops intersubjectively, rather than as an atomized whirlwind of random events. The innovation of Marx and Engels was to turn Hegel's idealist conception of dialectics and history upside down, and assert the primacy of the material world in the causal relation. This isn't to say that ideas don't matter, but an assertion of where ideas come from. It is not man's consciousness which determines his being, but rather man's social being which determines his consciousness. Rather than a conflict of ideas, Marx and Engels saw the driving motor force of history in how human beings sustain themselves through the production of their wants and needs. In other words, through a lens of political economy. History, rather than a story of the battle of ideas, was a story about how human beings develop forces of production, farms, factories, etc., and relations of production, bosses and workers, landlords and tenants, etc. Thus, for Marx and Engels, all hitherto existing history has been the history of class struggles. For them, as for Hegel, history remains dialectical. What has been transformed in their conception of history is that history is material as well as dialectical. Hence, dialectical materialism and historical materialism. Men make their own history, Marx wrote, but they do not do so under conditions of their choosing, but instead, under circumstances already existing, given and transmitted from the past. The past weighs like a nightmare upon the minds of the living. This is the essence of historical materialism. More on this when we discuss chapter 3. Back to you, Pup. Thanks, Melody. Well, from here, Ingalls argues that the socialism of earlier days certainly criticized the existing capitalist mode of production and its consequences but it could not explain them, and therefore could not get the mastery of them. Essentially, early socialism failed to properly challenge capitalism because it could not explain aspects like surplus value or exploitation. And Ingalls concludes, These two great discoveries, the materialistic conception of history and the revelation of the secret of capitalist production through surplus value, we owe to Marx. With these discoveries, socialism became a science. And lastly, chapter 3. This final chapter explains scientific socialism and its critiques of capitalism. To start, Ingalls argues that the manner in which wealth is distributed and society divided into classes or orders is dependent upon what is produced, how it is produced, and how the products are exchanged. From this point of view, the final causes of all social changes and political revolutions are to be sought, not in men's brains, not in men's better insight into eternal truth and justice, but in changes in the modes of production and exchange. Or as it says in the opening lines of the Communist Manifesto, the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles. Ingalls then explains the creation of capitalist appropriation and socialized production, namely that individuals used to own the means of production and owned what they produced, but as the means of production became concentrated in the hands of capitalists, the production became socialized and the product became appropriated by the capitalist. Or as Ingalls states, the products now produced socially were not appropriated by those who had actually set in motion the means of production and actually produced the commodities, but by the capitalists. That just sounds like slavery with extra steps! Having explained socialized production and capitalist appropriation, Engels then explains the contradictions between them, namely class warfare and alienation. Class warfare meaning the owner and worker want the exact opposite, the owner wants you to work as hard as possible for as little pay as possible, and you want the opposite of that. I explain this more thoroughly in my review of the Communist Manifesto. 
And for alienation, alienation means that workers are separated from what they produce, from their labor, from their fellow workers, left to be a mere cog in a machine, only contributing one small aspect to a much larger whole. As Marx put it in his Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844, quote, The external character of labor for the worker appears in the fact that it is not his own, but someone else's, that it does not belong to him, that in it he belongs, not to himself, but to another. As a result, therefore, man, the worker, feels himself freely active only in his animal functions, eating, drinking, procreating, or at most in his dwelling and dressing up, etc. And in his human functions he no longer feels himself to be anything but an animal. What is animal becomes human, and what is human becomes animal. You have probably experienced this in your own life. To see how this has played out in my life, let's compare two different jobs I've had. I have worked unloading freight at a few different corporate chain stores, and it's fairly hard work, super boring, and super alienating. You pick up a box, you open the box, you put the item on the shelf, you fold up the box, you pick up another box, over and over and over and over again, hundreds of times a day, 40 hours a week. I have also painted houses. I once spent 10 hours straight scraping lead paint off the side of a house in the hot sun and collecting the chips onto drop cloths and sweeping the chips into piles for collection and disposal. Now, categorically, these two jobs are both labor-intensive and, to be honest, lonely. However, with the house painting, I was there for every part of the house painting process, and I could see how my labor contributed to the greater whole. I knew that my contributions mattered, unlike unloading freight for a corporation, in which my contribution to the whole was minuscule, and I felt like my work didn't matter. And if I quit, or even if I died, it wouldn't really matter. The corporate machine would just keep on chugging. And that feeling like my work doesn't matter, that inability to see purpose in my work, that is alienation. Ingalls then points to a crisis in capitalism that has become increasingly important in our modern day. Machinery and automation. He states, Machinery becomes the most powerful weapon in the war of capital against the working class. That the instruments of labor constantly tear the means of subsistence out of the hands of the laborer. That the very product of the worker is turned into an instrument for his subjugation. It's a tool to produce abundance for little effort. We need to start thinking now about what to do when large sections of the population are unemployable through no fault of their own. What to do in a future where, for most jobs, humans need not apply. This takes place because, if the product belongs to the owner of the means of production, as Ingalls explained earlier, then putting more of that control in the hands of the owner gives the owner more control over the product. Let's look at a brief example of this. A grocery store in the 1940s. Well, the store owner is very reliant on the skills of the clerk to properly run the cash register. Though the clerk doesn't own the means of production, he does have some power in this relationship. But what about the same store in the year 2000? Well, now the cash register is totally computerized. More power is transferred to the owner as the clerk's skills are less essential. He becomes easily replaceable. What about that same store in 2020? Well, now the cash register is fully automated. There is no power to be distributed to the clerk because there is no clerk, and the owner maintains full power and control. These contradictions in capitalism, class warfare, and alienation lead to crisis. Describing economic crisis, Ingalls states, Commerce is at a standstill. The markets are glutted. Products accumulate. As multitudinous as they are unsellable. Hard cash disappears. Credit vanishes. Factories are closed. The mass of the workers are in want of the means of subsistence, because they have produced too much of the means of subsistence. Bankruptcy follows upon bankruptcy, execution upon execution. The stagnation lasts for years. Productive forces and products are wasted and destroyed wholesale, until the accumulated mass of commodities finally filter off, more or less depreciate in value, until production and exchange gradually begin to move again.
Ingalls explains a few things that happened to save a crisis in capitalism from becoming total collapse. Both things we see even today when crashes occur. 1. Monopoly control. One capitalist eats many smaller capitalists during the crisis, bringing the entire sector closer to monopoly control. And 2. The state comes in and intervenes either with converting the failed industry into state property or by bailing out the company. And Ingalls states, All the social functions of the capitalist are now performed by salaried employees. The capitalist has no further social function than that of pocketing dividends, tearing off coupons, and gambling on the stock exchange. This is covered in Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism by Lenin. Essentially, the capitalist receives all the benefits of socialism and yet retains the capitalist profits, the capitalist appropriation. Wall Street tumbled again Monday. The Treasury Department has formally asked Congress to approve a $700 billion bailout of the financial industry. The Bush administration proposal could be the largest government bailout of private industry in the nation's history. Some analysts say the final cost to taxpayers could top $1 trillion. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Ingalls' solution is that we need to replace the anarchy of production with a plan of production, based on the needs of the community and the individual, and that capitalist appropriation must be replaced by direct social appropriation of production, aka the workers' control of the means of production, and by direct individual appropriation of subsistence and enjoyment, aka that the consumer as opposed to the capitalist controls commodities. But how do we do this? Well, my perspective is this. We have now seen historically that there are some problems with centrally planned economies. Now, of course, those problems are far overstated by anti-communist propaganda, and also you could argue that these weren't true communist economies because they didn't have worker control of the means of production. But... Explaining that whole mess would take several hours, which is a bit much for covering a mere 60-page pamphlet. So let me just say that anarcho-communism and democratically planned economies or gift economies are the way to go. And I would point to texts like The Conquest of Bread or Pericon for some answers on that. As the Marxist-Leninist in the room, I have a perspective that's more sympathetic to centrally planned economies such as that of the former USSR. If you want to learn more about how the Soviet economy worked, and when it ran into problems, I'd recommend checking out Alec Nove's An Economic History of the USSR, 1917-1991. For a more comprehensive look at Soviet history, check out E. H. Carr's Foundations of a Planned Economy, 1926-1929. It's important for communists of today to know the history of the first nation based on Marxist ideas and account for both its successes and its failures. Even if you call yourself an anarcho-communist, libertarian socialist, etc., knowing this history, as well as the history of other socialist states such as China, Venezuela, and so on, is critical so as to not inadvertently fall into right-wing talking points about how socialism has killed bajillions of people and it's always doomed to fail. Certainly, a fair point. Ingalls then lays out the same conclusion as the Communist Manifesto. He states... The proletariat seizes political power and turns the means of production into state property. But in doing this, it abolishes itself as proletariat, abolishes all class distinctions and class antagonisms, abolishes also the state as a state. He argues that the state is a tool of subjugation, and soon as its powers are used to subjugate capitalism, it thus destroys subjugation as a whole then the state will become moot and fade away. Of course, this idea is contentious now that we've seen that there are just and unjust reasons for maintaining a state, protecting yourself from capitalist imperialism, or maybe for unsavory reasons. And here to offer that contentious opinion is me. From my perspective, we must apply the logic of historical materialism to the concept of the state itself. A state, after all, is a complex of social institutions that arise in historically specific conditions. 
the aristocratic republican states of Greece and Rome were necessitated by the facts of the slave-based economy. The monarchies of medieval Europe were similarly made to govern the feudal mode of production. The advent of capitalism required the creation of bourgeois republican parliamentary systems. Developing a socialist society in a global political economy so thoroughly dominated by U.S. European capitalist imperial hegemony, as the USSR strove to do starting in 1917, required a state that was able to deal with those material realities. For example, getting dogpiled by no less than 14 imperialist armies as soon as the Soviets had taken power, precipitating a brutal civil war that lasted until 1922. Hence, we cannot conceive of THE state abstractly and transhistorically. A state is not an abstract entity, but a concrete set of institutions constituted in historically specific conditions. A feudal state, a bourgeois state, and, yes, a socialist state. Each implies a certain complex of institutions necessary for the type of rule demanded by the political economy in question. Attempting to constitute socialism, which historically has predominantly occurred in colonized nations such as Russia, China, Vietnam, and so on, has required the formation of socialist states. A state, as opposed to the state in Marxist language, is simply the set of institutions used by one class for the repression of another. A socialist state, then, must be a state built for the purposes of suppressing its own internal bourgeois or colonial class, as well as to withstand the siege of the imperial onslaught from without. Does this mean that socialist states are infallible paragons of true socialism? No, of course not. And it is idealist, utopian as Engels would put it, to project those expectations onto what have been, for better or for worse, earnest attempts by committed revolutionaries the world over to achieve a society that can move beyond the depredations of capitalism. Engels continues, with the seizing of the means of production by society, production of commodities is done away with, and simultaneously the mastery of the product over the producer. Anarchy in social production is replaced by systematic, definite organization. The struggle for individual existence disappears. Then, for the first time, man, in a certain sense, is finally marked off from the rest of the animal kingdom and emerges from mere animal conditions of existence into really human ones. The whole sphere of the conditions of life which environ man, and which have hitherto ruled man, and now comes under the dominion and control of man, who for the first time becomes the real, conscious lord of nature, because he has now become master of his own social organization. Hey, wait a minute, I thought this wasn't utopian. <laughs> Ingalls then spends the last few pages of the text defining historical materialism, or what he calls historical evolution. 1. Medieval society and individual production. Then 2. Capitalist revolution, leading to capitalist appropriation and alienation, leading to class warfare, state monopoly capitalism, superabundance of products, and increased mechanization, leading to unemployment and the state, as a mechanism for saving capitalism through joint stock companies, buyouts, bailouts, and all that crisis of capitalism stuff mentioned earlier. And finally, three, proletarian revolution. Solution of the contradictions. What is called scientific socialism. The proletariat seizes the public power and by means of this transforms the socialized means of production slipping from the hands of the bourgeoisie into public property. And Ingalls concludes, Socialized production, upon a predetermined plan, becomes henceforth possible. The development of production makes the existence of different classes of society thenceforth an anachronism. In proportion as anarchy in social production vanishes, the political authority of the state dies out. Man, at last the master of his own form of social organization, becomes at the same time the lord over nature, his own master, free. Conclusion So there are some issues with the text, 
uh, centrally planned economies seem to have issues with hierarchy and adaptation, and the state, even a leftist state, seems to not quite dissolve as intended. And historical materialism has its own critics, both people outside of Marxism critiquing the supremacy of the base over the superstructure, and people from within Marxism, like David Harvey, arguing that Marx and Engels underestimated capitalism's ability to adapt to crisis through shifting the crisis of overproduction and unemployment, for example, onto the credit economy and the housing market, etc, etc. I recommend David Harvey's RSA animate video if you want to know more about that. If you want to read more about the dialectic of base and superstructure, and you're feeling a little ambitious, I'd recommend checking out Contradiction and Overdetermination, an essay by the French structuralist Marxist Louis Althusser. There are a lot of difficult to understand concepts in that essay, but a major thing it gets at is digging deeper into the relationships between the base and the superstructure. Namely, that we can't simply reduce all of capitalist society's contradictions to some supreme economic cause. Oftentimes, non-economic dimensions take precedence, and a complex of different factors form the basis of social phenomena, hence being overdetermined. The channel Then and Now has a great summary and application of this essay. I highly recommend it. Another relatively short text which covers related topics is On Contradiction by Mao. The Red Menace podcast covered this text in depth, as well as Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. I highly recommend checking out their podcast if you haven't already. Now, obviously, the explanations of scientific socialism found in the text are incredibly important. However, I think the most worthwhile contribution to the text is analyzing utopian socialism as ineffectual for not fully understanding how power, appropriation, alienation, and class warfare function in a capitalist economy. The argument basically goes as follows. The utopian socialists believed that they could design a form of socialism using reason and rationale that the capitalist class could look at and decide reasonably and rationally to adopt. Now let me throw a thin coat of paint on that argument and say it one more time. The utopian liberals believe that they can design a welfare system or a social safety net or healthcare system or low income housing or whatever using reason and rationale that the capitalist class can look at and decide reasonably and rationally to adopt. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not making a reform versus revolution argument here. I do ultimately believe that revolution is necessary, but I'm certainly not going to waste my time and energy fighting against positive reforms. Rather, my argument is this. Just like the utopian socialists failed to fully understand class conflict and the capitalist mode of appropriation causing their vision of society to fall short of reality and land in utopian thinking, in this same way, many liberals today promoting recycling programs and plastic bag and bottle and straw bans and tax credits for fuel-efficient cars and a more progressive tax system and slightly less horrible foreign interventions and things like this, these liberals are also failing to fully understand class conflict and the capitalist mode of appropriation. And so we must, as Engels wished to do, cast off the utopian socialists, cast off the utopian liberals, and promote scientific socialism. Speaking of reform or revolution, let's talk about how reforms are achieved for just a moment. Do liberal or social democratic politicians sometimes enact reforms that are helpful to working class people? Absolutely. But historically, what's shown to win reforms much more readily is direct action for example, last spring in West Virginia, public school teachers went on an illegal wildcat strike to demand a pay increase, not just for themselves, but for all public school employees. And they won a pretty significant concession, a 5% pay increase across the board, again for all public school employees. This is in a state where nearly 20% of the population live below the poverty line, and where the opioid crisis has hit harder than almost anywhere else in the country with a deeply conservative legislature dominated by the Republicans. So was it Bernie Sanders to the rescue? No, it was independent working class self-activity, 
The capitalist state would much rather deal with us quietly going to the polls and voting for a social democratic politician. It's a safe, temporary alternative which doesn't involve pesky things like strikes, street protests, or even... Riots? Not that we would ever condone such dastardly, uncouth things on your channel, though, right, Rads? <laughs> uh, of course not, Melody. The dichotomy of reform or revolution is not, should we go to the polls or not, but rather, how do we mobilize ourselves as an independent working class to demand these reforms from the system? That is, ultimately, the problem posed by socialism, utopian, and scientific. As Frederick Douglass once said, power concedes nothing without demand. The utopians of Engels' time were reformers who thought that capitalism could be managed with kinder masters, like Robert Owen with his new Lanark cotton mill. But the historical lesson of the Paris Commune in Engels' own time, and later the successful but costly defense of the October Revolution, is that capitalism bites back, and it bites hard. Thanks for doing this review with me, Rads. If you want to see more videos about history and political theory, be sure to check out my channel, A World to Win. My ongoing series at the time of recording this video is an exploration of the history of the Democratic Party in the United States from a radical leftist perspective. If that sounds interesting, head on over to my channel and check it out. Also, make sure to check out the handwritten notes I took while doing research for this video if you want a more detailed look at socialism, utopian, and scientific. Link in the description. No problem, Melody. I really appreciated you helping me tackle this text. And, as always, I'd like to thank my wonderful patrons. As many of you know, I've been using these wonderful donations to treat myself with fish oil and other supplements and top shelf food and other goodies. And most importantly, I recently got dog insurance and I can now get regular checkups and shots and all that good stuff. In fact, the vet told me on my last checkup that I'm in the prime of my life, so that's exciting. And if you would like to support me on Patreon, you like the work I do here, then you can go to patreon.com slash radical reviewer. And if you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical reviews here with the radical reviewer. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Sorry you feel this way, but perhaps if I explain things, you'll see the light of reason. This old rusty, as you call it, is school property. And as the keeper of school property, I feel a certain sense of ownership over it. So in the name of Third Street School, it is my responsibility to say to you, Get off my jungle gym! Your jungle gym?